The coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades, and this country is not alone. All over the world we're seeing the devastating impact of this invisible killer. To put it simply, if too many people become seriously unwell at one time, the NHS will be unable to handle it, meaning more people are likely to die, not just from coronavirus, but from other illnesses as well. The time has now come for us all to do more. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. The way ahead is hard, and it is still true that many lives will, sadly, be lost. And therefore, I urge you, at this moment of national emergency, to stay at home, protect our NHS, and save lives. Thank you. Coronavirus is about to change the world as we know it. By now, we've been made aware of the symptoms the virus shows in our physical health. But what about our mental health? With statistics already as high as one in four people already suffering from a mental health problem here in the UK, what effect could COVID-19 have on our already declining mental health problem here in the Northeast? I want to explore how people around me are coping with life in lockdown, giving me an honest and insightful look into their lives and how they are trying to maintain a sense of mental well-being. My name's Michael, I'm a design manager within the construction sector. For a bit of context on how I might be coping or getting on in lockdown, probably worth mentioning that since as long as I can remember, I've had various mental health issues with delusions of grandeur problems and, and kind of depersonalization problems and uh, depression as I got older. My name's Kerry, I'm 48. I suffer from depression and anxiety. I'm also a recovering alcoholic. Hi, yeah, I'm Vicky Robson. I'm 26 and I live in Gator and I work in the Kiwi Hospital as a healthcare and rehab assistant. Hi, my name's Lauren. I'm 28 years old and I live in Gateshead with my husband and my little boy. I'm a project manager working in the railway industry. Prior to the coronavirus pandemic, I thankfully wasn't suffering from any mental health issues, although I have suffered from anxiety in the past. Hi, I'm Steph. I'm 35 and I live in Newcastle in the northeast of England. Full-time carer for my daughter who has autism. I've got anxiety, definitely, and depression. I was diagnosed just literally before the lockdown. Hi, my name is Glenn Charleston. I'm 39 years old. I live in Newcastle and I've got ADHD, which is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Hi, I'm Liz. I'm 39 and 40 this year. I've got two children. I live with my partner Michael who's also on the documentary. In terms of my job, I work for Bernardo's as a youth and community worker working with vulnerable children and young people. In terms of my mental health, I don't have any diagnosis and I've never received any like formal treatment. I have sought help on a few occasions for anxiety. My name's Jimmy. I'm uh, 60, 60 years of age. At the minute I'm heading up a little project run by the Rotary Recovery Trust. The idea is to ensure that vulnerable people in recovery from addiction have access to uh, online facilities, you know, mobile phones, tablets, data, that type of thing, so that they can keep in touch, you know, during this, this COVID lockdown. I live in uh, Spittle Towns, which is a little area just outside Newcastle. You know, on a personal note, I I've been in recovery from alcoholism for over 10 years now. Hello, I am Caitlin. I'm 21 years old and I live in Gateshead. At the minute I'm a student. I'm about to progress onto my PJCE course. Within a year, I will be a qualified teacher. Currently suffer from anxiety and OCD. My name's Amy. I'm 34 years old from Jarrow and I've suffered in the past from anxiety, depression and addiction. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Charlotte, I'm 20, I'm in Newcastle, I'm a student but I also work part-time in retail and I suffer from anxiety. When lockdown was announced, there was lots of different things that for me were going to change. Like everyone in the world, everyone has their own unique story and things that they need to, you know, achieve daily, weekly, monthly. For me, you know, I don't drink alcohol, I don't smoke, and I, I need to speak to like-minded people who are the same. Part of that is going to certain groups each week to maintain my sobriety. If I don't go to those groups, then my sobriety is in jeopardy and I have got more of a chance of relapsing. My sobriety is the most important thing because if I don't have that, then I don't have anything else in my life. So that was directly under threat when the lockdown was announced. How long is this gonna go on for? What, what's gonna be the outcome? How serious is it really? Is this real? You know, all of them, all of them thoughts that can go through your head. So, you know, I, I've said, I've said not goodbyes, but I've said sort of farewells to a, to a few good friends tonight. Obviously we can still keep in touch on telephone and social media, etc. But, you know, I think maybe life as I've come to know it, life as we've come to know it is, is going to change for a while. I think initially had quite a negative effect at first because I was panicking and I didn't really know the ins and outs of it. I wasn't sure how my family and friends were going to get through it, if they were going to get through it. I live a really busy life. I've got two jobs. I work in a restaurant and I work in a bar and I also DJ at private parties and stuff like that. Bite more off than I can choose sometimes and I never get to see my partner. Even though we live together, he's working from home. I'm not at work and in, in, in either of my jobs. I just feel like I can't really whinge, like it's, I'm quite grateful. I'm home in a house that I really love living in, but I would say in a way, like it's actually really nice to press pause. I wouldn't dare suggest that this is a positive thing, what's going on in the world, but if, if it's something beyond your control, you, you can, the only thing you can do is control the environment that you're in. I'm just focused on, on other things, on positive things, instead of being scared about what's going on in the world outside. When the lockdown first happened, I was really frightened. Um, I felt a huge sense of loss of control, so I was panicking about that. Me, uh, son's autistic, and um, I have a little girl as well. And the thing that just frightened us more than anything was just the loss of everything that I knew and, and the sense of certainty I had in my life and where it was going and what I had. My son, who's autistic, I was just absolutely panicking that he would respond really poorly to the school's closing and actually he's happier than he's ever been in his entire life. The other thing was um, the relationships that I have and the communities that I live in are very physical based. So I go and I see people and they keep me well and that was all taken away. So I've had to look at alternative methods to stay sane and I've moved it all onto Zoom. I miss the physical interaction and I can't wait for things to open up again. But I get 90% of what I need from the Zoom meetings I'm having with friends and people for support. So all in all, my mental health is actually, it's it's been in good condition. So today I've been up, I've cleaned the full house, I've made some dinner. Actually doing some uni work right now, um, which is progress because I've found it really, really hard to find motivation to do uni work. So even getting a paragraph done is better than nothing. However... I still haven't mastered getting ready, as you can see, and I can't stop eating crap. Like, I can't, can't stop. I really need to pack it in because I'm gaining so much weight. Before all this happened, I had lost so much weight and I was so proud of myself, which is really bringing my mood down. But, given the circumstances, I do think you've got to be easy on yourself. And I think once my uni work's handed in, I might hopefully be able to get myself in the mind frame to get back to clean eating and back to just caring for myself a bit more. A lot of the time, addicts or alcoholics or, you know, eat people who eat too much or um, whatever your, your vice is, they do it alone in isolation. Ultimately, your addiction wants you by yourself. My immediate thought was this isolation is going to be like the hell it was when I was drinking by myself, not speaking to the outside world, not having any relationships with family or friends. I feel that I need to keep strong relationships with people. I need to 
always include myself in things. So if I don't speak to people on a regular basis, especially people in recovery, then I'll start to forget what it was like and my mental health will start to tell me that I wasn't that bad and I can have a drink when reality is it was horrific and you need always need that reminder from people. In this situation, a lot of people are struggling. Normally they go to work, they talk to their colleagues, they talk to, you know, friends and they haven't got that as much now. They're stuck in the house with partners, with children, parents, you know, people who you would not normally spend so much time. I'm outside in the park doing our daily exercise. People say it's a roller coaster like day by day. For me it feels more like a roller coaster minute by minute. I just find it unbelievably demanding having the children all the time. They're not sleeping and I'm sure that's their way of expressing their worry or their concern or just their feeling unsettled that things are different. When it got announced, I was in Glasgow because that's where I study. Firstly, it was okay because I was around my friends. And then when lockdown got announced, that was absolutely terrifying for me because I was in Glasgow and my family is in Newcastle. I already have anxiety and I'm definitely a worrier. I'm a very emotional person, so it's quite hard for me to deal with a lot of emotions. I was really overwhelmed and stressed and my reaction to that is crying. I just cry. Then when I finally got back, thanks to my mum, it was a relief. I was so happy to be here, I was happy to be with my family and then since then it has been honestly quite difficult. Right now I'm meant to be in uni, I'm meant to be with my friends. I feel kind of robbed of my second year a little bit of uni because I haven't been able to finish it and I haven't been able to live it the way that I wanted to. I think it's difficult for my mum maybe being home because I am such a loud personality and she doesn't always want that all the time and communication is difficult here i feel like because we don't want to offend each other i guess but that then leads to more issues down the line today i've had a day off i've had a very productive day i've been shopping been a little bit pissed off today i've bought some ice cream that'll make us feel better i haven't been anxious at all today apart from having to go to asda and do my shopping which during lockdown, I absolutely hate. You know, Asda's got a brilliant one-way system which helps people, you know, everyone's going in the right direction. So it, it really helps with keeping your distance from people, but people just take no fucking notice of it. And they come really close to you because they want to get something off the shelf. Nobody says, excuse me. I think that's, that's really upset us today. And I ended up getting loads more things in Asda because I don't want to have to go back. Normally, I find it hard to stay in the house, even just for one day. I literally, like, feel like I'm going to go insane. I've just been diagnosed with having um, depression and anxiety, literally, like, two weeks before. Yeah, I just wasn't sure. I how I would cope. I'm definitely craving like some kind of like social interaction like with friends. Um, I miss like having people over on the weekend and seeing friends and stuff. So these anxieties that we're seeing are purely born out of being locked down due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Are these the sort of things we're going to see grow with the months and years to come? A lot to do with how I feel is routine and structure. A lot of the things that I would normally do, I'm still doing. I have the same morning routine and tidy my room and get dressed and prepare for work. Me and the kids go for a walk before nine o'clock every morning. So I think it's routine that's really keeping us steady because I know where the day starts and I know where it ends and I'm still going to bed at the same time. I haven't like haven't fallen into any of those unhealthy habits. I think a heady mixture of like radical acceptance of the situation and keeping me routine is, is having a good effect on us. The social climate that I'm around is a massively supportive place and that's a huge, huge amount to do with why I'm still feeling great. I'm feeling a lot more positive because I feel like there's an end in sight for uni. We've got one more week of the second round of lockdown, which has made us feel a bit happier. Although I do think that we'll probably get another three weeks added on. I just want to go into my little granddad's house and have me tea and have a bit natter. I've literally got two written bits left to do and then hopefully that's me done my degree. I am sad that we're not getting a graduation when I think about it. I was always a bit unsure whether I was going to go or not. Now it's been taken away I'm quite sad. However, long as that this lockdown's over so I can at least celebrate with my family, um, 
I'll be happy about that. So yeah, I'm feeling quite positive today. I've had a lovely shower as well. I'm still not dressed, but I've had a lovely shower. So I feel good. Hi, just doing the dishes. Thought I would try and film while I'm doing a job because obviously there's always a job to do. I felt a bit anxious yesterday, just like a general on edge feeling. I've been thinking a lot about the government's response, finding out more about failings. Uh, and I think that's one of my biggest anxieties is that they're gonna keep making mistakes and they're gonna just cause more destruction and death. Apparently it's tipped that there will be some easing of lockdown and I think that's the wrong decision. So I'm um, apprehensive and I won't necessarily follow those guidelines. And I think that's a difficult position to be in when you just don't feel like you're in a safe pair of hands. You're meant to be able to trust the government that they've got your best interests at heart. That's not what I think. That's not how I feel at all. Um, I've been out and about this morning. There's definitely a lot more people. Maybe people are starting to get a little bit complacent. What's gonna happen next? Like, how do we hold this government to account? Like, I have quite a lot of rage. What I believe are thousands of unnecessary deaths based on decisions made by the government. It's quite a scary situation to be in because it would be a lot more comfortable to just really believe that they had our best interests at heart and they're doing everything they can. But that's just not, not what I believe at all. We are doing so poorly with this pandemic. Boris said that the, we would just, we will lose people. That's something we'll just have to accept. No, these countries are actually being proactive and they are doing their best. They are doing more than their best to beat this, whereas we are not. Even the fact that the NHS is so underfunded is a result of Tory leadership, yet people are clapping for them on a Thursday. That also blows my mind. You're clapping for them, but yet you're voting for people who are not paying them their money. The money that they need to feed themselves, to feed their families, and then also money going into the NHS that could be used properly. You're voting for people who are wanting to privatise that stuff, privatise things that at this in this pandemic would bankrupt so many people. My main worry at the minute about lockdown is the government going to relax some of the rules on the weekend. Me personally, as an NHS worker, I think this is a bad idea. We've only got approximately six patients in ICU on a ventilator, which is like a massive step down to what we had from when it first started. Now, if the rules are going to be relaxed and people are going to go out and about, have gatherings, barbecues, whatever, we're going to have an influx of deaths. We're going to have a second wave in, as everybody knows, a second wave of infection is always the worst. Yes, we've got the Nightingale Hospital ready and open in preparation in Washington, which is going to house 440 patients if needed. But if this infection gets out of control, it's going to be the case of the NHS choosing who lives, who dies. Now imagine having an old person who's fought for the country, for example, having a young person who's not really had much of a life. How would you feel if you had to tell that old person that you weren't going to give them a ventilator because you were going to save that young person? How would you feel telling them families your decision and how you've come to that decision? People need to think about this. For example, it's my friend Keith Dunn and he was a nurse in South Tyneside. He's just lost his life. He died suddenly at home with COVID and a couple of days after his mum and dad passed away of the disease as well. If that doesn't make the government stop and think where the infection has literally just took out a family of three, then they need to give their heads a wobble. Because like I say, yes, the NHS is coping at the minute, but how long for? We're beginning to see a change in people's daily lives and how they're being directly affected. One specific topic we haven't looked at in more detail is politics. After all, this whole lockdown has been led by politics and future decisions will also be decided by politicians. I've organised a Zoom call with former Labour MP Laura Pidcock to help me understand the connection between the political response to coronavirus and the impact on mental health, specifically the impact it will likely have during the lockdown. We are in the middle of a global health pandemic, but we are also in the middle, in my opinion, of a political crisis in the United Kingdom. In my view, we are one of the poorest performing nations in relation to how we are dealing with coronavirus. And if we think that how that that connects to how people are mentally able to cope in these situations, we have to think about it as a collective as well as like the individual. Quite often when mental health difficulties appear, it's because there is little or no control over people's lives. Uh, there is an intense amount of fear and worry. Uh, there might be a predisposition to mental health difficulties, but I am of the belief that mental health 
health problems are very very much exacerbated by environmental circumstances and by conditions of poverty and by what you think will happen to you either by the state your bank uh, your landlord uh, your employer all of these things have a very kind of heavy effect on the soul and how mentally well you can be within the system. And what we have endured in the United Kingdom is a decade of austerity. And by austerity, I mean a political decision, the political choice to remove billions of pounds worth of money from public services and community resources and in the freezing of wages for working class people in the name of reducing the debt and the deficit of the nation but in reality it is my view that it was a political choice to change the nature of what the state actually does and what effect that has on people uh, is that there is a, a, a degradation there is a poverty that becomes about our communities so uh, library shut things become more expensive food becomes more expensive that's kind of a, a broader political issue but it becomes more expensive because people's wages are cut so the amount that they have each month to actually live on and not just to survive like to pay bills and to um, pay their mortgage or rent but to actually get treats you know can we afford anything that's additional anything that's extra and for many many people in work work in some of the longest hours in the whole of Europe uh, the answer is no they can't afford anything additional not only can they not afford anything additional they can't afford the basics they are getting into debt certainly people on minimum wage jobs but not only those people because outgoings are so huge for people and personal debt is so huge for people and when people have so much debt too there is a huge amount of fear much more mental health problems is there going to be a knock at the door from a bailiff is there going to be uh, you know am I going to lose everything you know often the fear is about what are you going to lose and the worry and that becomes crushing and anxiety kind of embeds and increases so if we think about the whole of the United Kingdom or the whole of the world this system is actually ripe for mental health problems then when you layer on top of that a global pandemic what a recipe for extreme mental health problems as you mentioned at the very beginning of this it is people who are rescuing other people not governments in order not to appear politically biased i got in touch with the mp for blythe valley conservative ian levy well, we've got the email liam and uh, one of the teams going to provide a response it's just takes two or three days to get that pulled together no no that's fine just because we're doing the um filming now so we're just wanting to like tie things up so i really right. wanted to get a, a response from ian if that I'll, ch I'll chase i'll chase i'll chase the member of the team that's dealing with it. i did see your email coming on friday Liam, but brilliant it, it, it'd been a long day and i, I didn't get a chance to respond no of course that. no that's um, fine I'll, I'll, I'll um i'll chase a colleague just to let i know that you've been in touch and we'll get a response to you as quick as we can Liam. Okay. brilliant thank you very much for your help okay. cheers okay. bye bye call, Liam. cheers bye As of this point, my questions remain unanswered. So today, I actually managed to put some makeup on. How many weeks have we been locked down now? Now, I would say it was just because I wanted to feel good about myself, but that's a total lie. Today, I think I'll feel a bit more positive after I've spoken my lecturers. I think I'll have a better idea of what I'm meant to be doing. It's just been a massive struggle trying to do my degree from home. It's really hard to get motivated and know what you're writing about. You kind of go to the library and get books, and then the books you need on an e-book, and oh, it's just a big mess. So I can't wait for Boris to have a chat on Thursday and tell what's going to happen next. So I'm hoping there's going to be some good news soon, and... Things are going to look up, but as of now... Today I woke up and I was feeling a bit flat, I think, because yesterday was a bank holiday and it was a bit anticlimactic. And I feel a bit alone as well. I don't want to say lonely, but maybe it is borderline lonely. So I'm going to try and connect with friends today on uh, Zoom meetings or something, see if I can catch up with people. So, yeah. I'm absolutely exhausted the bags are real it was um a late one last night we had a family quiz it was so good but it really brought home how much i'm missing seeing everybody quite productive today because i handed in my second to last assignment for uni that's been really hard work especially because it's a master's um in creative writing a lot of us 
are going back to university um, after quite a significant break from doing my previous degrees. People are doing it who are aspiring writers and I think it's really, really difficult to be creative at the moment. The, the assignment has been affected by COVID-19. Um, uh, altogether, I'm happy with the piece that I've handed in. Mental health wise, it's been a pretty stable day. Not as much on a high as I was yesterday. Waiting to hear what Boris has to say tomorrow night. I think everybody's just in an enormous amount of anticipation over that. Yeah, we'll see what tomorrow brings. So yeah, I'm thinking about Sunday and what's gonna happen. I just, I personally think it's a wrong move. I really don't think they should be relaxing things at this stage. In fact, I think they should probably make it more locked down. So like flights incoming and stuff. Like my brother flew back from Thailand last week. He could have had anything. He just came back in the country. I don't know. I'm hoping he hasn't got it, obviously. But I mean, he hasn't been tested. I thought they would have kind of vetted people coming in. Like they didn't even check their temperatures apparently in Thailand or when they landed back in the UK. He said like on the flight, they're from Thailand. Like, no one was socially distanced. But he said there was people on the flight not wearing masks. So I just think it's absolutely mental. I think it's crazy. I don't know what'll happen Sunday, but I know that our family are just gonna be staying in for the time being until it it goes, I guess. If it ever goes, who know I don't know. It's it's like one of those things you just don't know. You don't know what's gonna happen, that's the worst bit. You just don't know how long this could go on for. It is now almost two months since the people of this country began to put up with restrictions on their freedom and Though the death toll has been tragic and the suffering immense, it is a fact that by adopting those measures we prevented this country from being engulfed by what could have been. We must continue to control the virus. There are millions of people who are both fearful of this terrible disease and at the same time also fearful of what this long period of enforced inactivity will do to their livelihoods and their mental and physical well-being. We said that you should work from home if you can and only go to work if you must. Anyone who can't work from home should be actively encouraged to go to work and we want it to be safe for you to get to work. Work from home if you can, but you should go to work if you can't. At the earliest by June the 1st, after half term, we believe we may be in a position to begin the phased reopening of shops and to get primary pupils back into schools. We will come back. We can be stronger and better than ever before, more economically dynamic, but for now, we must stay alert, control the virus, and save lives. So there you go. Boris has just made his much-awaited speech. Didn't make much sense to me. I didn't really get a clear message. Just managed to go round in circles and not say anything new apart from this new slogan, stay alert, instructing people to maybe get back to work the very next day, not to recount, you know, sort of transport and childcare and all in all I found it quite a quite a confusing message the thing that impressed me was of course that uh, he's had his hair done and so for me i need to ask if he's been sort of adhering to this two meter rule as everybody else is how the hell did he manage to get his hair cut just been listening to boris's announcement which i have to admit I found a little bit confusing. This whole stay alert instead of stay at home, I don't really understand it. So I think for me, I'll still be staying at home and just continuing as I have been, just to protect myself and to protect the people around us. It does make us feel a little bit anxious that people, other people will just be doing whatever they want. For all he's saying, continue to social distance. Are they really going to do that? They don't really social distance currently. So yeah, so it's a little bit scary. So I've just watched the announcement of Boris Johnson to say what's going to happen. Overall, I think... It was terrible, absolutely abysmal. So the general thing is that we're going to start opening up, but it's going to be slow, but absolutely no direction or detail over what that looks like. Just a vague, if you can go to work, do go to work. It was so vague and wishy-washy that I think it's just going to lead to untold problems for day-to-day -day people. So anybody sitting at home now is thinking, does my employer want us to go to work? Do they not want us to go to work? Is it reasonable for me to be at home? Is it all right that I'm going to have to be at home because I don't have any childcare now and I'm still going to have noise in the background of work calls? Are they going to be okay with that? Are they going to tell us to come in? If I don't go in, am I going to be sacked? Absolutely horrified 
that they think the kids can go back to school on the 1st of June. I'm just sickened that there's a new COVID response team and that they're the ones that are going to do the analysis between the R number and the actual deaths um, to decide whether or not we're in a good range or a bad range. We need to tighten up or we need to, we can let things off a bit. A new department just what governments thrive on, more bureaucracy. We already have departments that can roll this out. They're called public health. We've got Public Health England and every local authority in the country has a public health department and we should be doing everything from local communities. They've got all the information about who they're with. They've got all the best knowledge in the, in the area. Why do they need to create a new government body? They're literally taking no advice from the countries that have done this well. But who is the worst in Europe and the second worst in the world? Great Britain. This is not going to end well for the country. And you know what I think is really poor as well? I think it's really poor that we've gone from having, this is exactly what we need you to do for the next 21 days. Three weeks, this is what we're going to do. And now he's given an announcement which was just, and this is maybe, possibly, might just be what we're going to do for months and months and months. Just ridiculous. Not happy at all. I'm not sure how I feel about it, really. Not too impressed, if I'm honest. Don't think it provided any real clarity. I totally get that we've got to get the economy up and moving, that people are worried about their livelihoods. But I think the whole statement about people returning to work has just hand things completely back on business and I feel like oh, we're doing the right thing and what steps are businesses taking, what steps are the government saying that businesses should be taking to protect their employees, are they going to implement things which means that there's strict social distancing, there's no fear within their workforce that this virus has been allowed to spread like wildfire that they're going to be bringing back. With my company as one of the key businesses we've been working throughout the pandemic, a lot of strict control measures as long as other businesses are doing the same thing and we're making sure that everyone's protected, people who are out and about, people who are sat in the offices. It's an absolute logistical minefield. Like, for example, going into a large office buildings, how are you gonna maintain social distancing in the toilets? How are you gonna maintain it in the kitchens? It's it just, every time you, th you think of one solution, it comes up with another problem. As far as the other things that you mentioned, exercise, we can do that unlimited. We can get in a car and drive to places. And I just feel like this whole picnic thing, people will be meeting up with, with, with friends and family. They say, just do it within your household groups. But will it be adhered to? Will people listen to it? I really hope that they do because I feel like, if the, well, if they don't, it's going to prolong this and all of this work that we've been doing over the, the, the past seven, six, seven weeks, it'd just be for nothing. We got all excited for nothing. What's different? I know that we can exercise a bit more and people can go back to work if they can't work from home. But what I don't understand is how you can go back to work and mix with other households but not see your family. Maybe I've took it wrong um, and there might be more advice tomorrow about if you can see your family. But I think that's what a lot of people wanted to know. I want to be able to see my family and my little cousins, my granda. <sighs> it's just shit. Keep up the social distancing and stay safe. Stay alert. <laughs> yeah. Just watched Boris. He's just told her about new um, things that are put in place. I don't think any, there is anything that's really been put in place. He's just saying stay alert. The only thing I took from that was that the restaurants may be opening from July, which means I'm going to be off for a few more weeks. Obviously frustrating for like people who are self-employed and people um, who need the work to get through. I'm actually really fortunate because I'm still in a position where I'm being paid. The unlimited exercise, well, I was doing that anyway. As long as I was keeping social distance, like, to me, it didn't matter. I like, I, you know, I like cycling and I like running and I also have a dog, so I can't just do one. But yeah, I just hope everyone stays safe. So what's your first reactions to Boris's announcement? I think it is further unclear advice, not clear enough advice. That'll probably send probably the poorest in the country into panic that they've got to go to work with 12 hours notice and also how they're going to get childcare, how they're going to get to work if they can't go on public transport. I also don't think any advice he gives is being properly enforced or policed in any way anyway. 
the construction industry has been open that I'm aware of for over a week now anyway. Yet he's talking about lifting it tomorrow. It seems to me that his main purpose is to boost business faith in him by coming up with a plan that doesn't need to be issued at this point. But he's just trying to provide a boost to the economy at the expense of poor people and the health of the population as a whole. It's unbelievably reckless, considering the fact that people have already been picnicking, gathering in public places, that he's now given us the go-ahead to say, go out as much as you want, sunbathe, have a picnic, play sports with your family in the park. The evidence is overwhelmingly telling us that this is a massive threat and the amount of new cases, the amount of deaths every day is still unacceptably high. How many of these organisations, like schools and stuff, have been, like, warned that all of a sudden, if you're a head teacher or a deputy head teacher, you're now all of a sudden going to have to have children, reception children, by the way, who have absolutely no way of adhering to social distancing guidance. You're now meant to find a way of keeping yourself and your children safe like it's not possible the national education you know union has been calling for particular guidelines particular things to be met are they listened to are they fuck who, who are the experts that they speak to because it's certainly not the unions it's certainly not the frontline nurses and doctors who have been telling us you know that they haven't got what they need and also like i was absolutely outraged to hear that he said it is roundabout now that we should be thinking of quarantining people who arrive into the country like to me that's like the most obvious thing that you would have done and every other country was doing that literally months ago we're obviously massively behind the curve on that and it just seems bizarre timing that as you start lifting restrictions all of a sudden you're boasting about your restrictions on travel and your checks on travel he hasn't got a clue about the, the real world this is basically in my mind like, it's impossible not to have a class analysis on this. It's impossible not to see the idea, like, the conservative ideology threaded throughout absolutely every decision that they're making. Yeah, and it also it gives them the opportunity as well to, to take furlough off the table as well. Yeah, well, that's exactly what I thought when I was listening, that they'll be rescinding furlough, so now there'll be people that are literally forced into going back to work. If they haven't got childcare, I bet they'll be forced to kind of accept help from family members and stuff, therefore putting that entire family unit at risk. It's just a shambles, and, and I agree with everyone who's saying that it's not even clear. And like you said, why did we need to have all these ifs and buts and possibles? Because at the end of the day, right now, people just need to know right now, is it safe? And the answer is no, it is not safe to be going out and mixing with, with, with other people. It's as if none of that history ever happened in terms of second waves. I spoke to my friend today who works in the NHS. She said they are gearing up for the second wave, for the spike. So watching the latest update about Boris Johnson lifting some of the lockdown rules... It's ridiculous. He said nothing about being able to see family, but we can go to a park or a beach and we can go out for unlimited exercise. You've got more chance of causing a second wave of the virus by doing this. It's absolutely brainless. I don't know what the hell he's playing it. If anything, they should make the rules so people can see, like, immediate family in small clusters rather than telling everybody that they can go out, which is obviously as soon as the well is nice, every bugger's going to be out. Now, he says the NHS is coping for now, which, yes, we are. We all got deployed a critical care at the start of the pandemic to help. Now we're all being pulled back because we're not needed, which is good. But as soon as the second wave takes hold, and like I say, the second wave is always worse. If this government wants to allow that to happen, then so be it. I honestly don't know how many more people's got to die for them to pay attention. For many of our contributors, this is where the journey ends in lockdown. Following the announcement from Boris and the easing of lockdown, it leaves many of them deemed to be working class, no choice but to go back to work. As our contributors begin to try and make their way forward within society and try and adjust to the new normal, I wanted to catch up with them via Zoom to talk about their experience of lockdown and how they're reflecting on it. Thank you for taking part. Every day was different, wasn't it? Like, mm -hmm. one day you'll be all right, next day you'll be a little bit <laughs> down or anxious. And that's probably, that's a, that's what I was like, actually. At the beginning, you had a lot of anxieties about uni and stuff, didn't you? I finished everything, and I pressed the submit button, and honestly, I thought I'd feel like this massive weight off my shoulders. If anything, I think it made me really sad. I bigged myself up to having this graduation handing a bit of work and then shopping for me dressing, what my hair was going to be like, what my makeup was going to be like, to just press a button and go, and that's that. What's going to happen afterwards with mental yeah. health? Yeah. 
people, the same thing is probably going to happen in that system. And what's really interesting is for the last 10 years, like the government have cut funding to mental health services. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a massive thing in my area at the minute as well. Um, The hospital up the road, they had um, like a Tranwell unit in that that's been there for as long as I can remember. Now I'm 21 and that recently got closed down. So that was a massive thing in Gated. So yeah. that just goes to show you how big these cuts are. Like if people that are a danger to themselves kind of get help, what about the people that just need to yeah. talk, need a CBT stuff? That's a bit more lower level, but still important. I've been having like waves of like feeling great and then feeling a bit flat. The first thing I do is meditate and then I'll think about what I want to do. Three things. It could just be three things that I'll really enjoy doing. It doesn't have to be a task. How are you uh, feeling about like coming out of it? Like going back to work? Like- I just feel like I've just got used to like being off and doing all these really nice things like loads of self-care and long walks and runs and bike rides and meditation and cooking all the time. Like my my life normally is like a million miles an hour so yeah. I don't have to do, I don't normally get a chance to do all these things so when I go back I think I will, I think I'll feel a bit down. We'll catch up soon, I'll see you in a couple of years. I will die. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you 2022 or somewhere. Right, all right, mate, see ya. Hi, girls. Hi. You, know, you don't normally live together, the two of you. Like, I remember for me when I moved out of my house with my parents and then I moved back, I, it was weird. It's been interesting and it's been difficult. We'll have butted heads a couple of times. Not as much as I thought we would. For me, like, the thought of integrating back into society is quite a scary thing. What about you guys? For me, I've trekked the easing of lockdown as not being any different because I do have fears about there being a second spike and I don't want to get used to going back to normal and then having to go. I'd rather just remain the way we are and see what happens. I feel like the economy's definitely been put first. The approach from the very beginning that we needed herd immunity is just absolutely outrageous because... Places have not done that and they've already recovered. So was herd immunity ever the solution? I don't think so. The last one for you, Kerry. You've spoken in your little vlogs about recovery. Is the lockdown affecting recovery in a negative way or was it? How do you think you're going to go on when you come out of lockdown? I, I think that initially... Um, I really didn't like the online meetings. I didn't like them at all. You know, online meetings have been available for a long time and I've never chosen to do them. But I'm getting better at the online meetings. And I do think moving forward for some people, I think it would be good for some of the online meetings to continue. I think what's going to be interesting as well is for the people who have got so used to doing this sort of life and then they have to go back and get back into their own life, I think it's going to be a bit of a shock. Certainly what I've experienced in this situation is there's a lot of employers have always said you can't work from home. For some people, this could absolutely change their lives and their work-life balance could become amazing. There's going to be some people that are going to come out of lockdown and their lives are going to have changed for the better. But then there's going to be some people who come out of lockdown and you know, their mental health is going to massively be effective. They're going to struggle to go back to what it was like before. Thank you very much for doing this. How are you mentally? How are you feeling within yourself? Are you getting used to, to this life? Or I feel like I am. Like, I, I feel like I've, I've just adapted, like, as a family. I think it was really, like, the first few weeks were really tough. Kind of paused everything, hasn't it? So I don't know how easy it's going to be to go back into that. Into that but... hectic life, I know. Yeah. For me, I've had that, but then I haven't. Work has been absolute chaos. I'm doing, like... 50 plus hour weeks between 10 and 12 hours plus a day it has been don't get us wrong it has been a challenge because the type of job that I do were quite a big team with like different specialties within the team so not being with the team and knowing what's going on has been difficult because some of them are, are in the office little in Zach what's going to happen personally I don't think if, if we can't go and see our own family at our ho- it, 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 it homes yeah. I don't see how it's then safe for, for teachers to mix with kids from multiple house, households. I saw an interview and they're like, well, it's going to affect the job prospects. And I was like, affect the job prospects of like four and five-year-olds, really? Or like, 
Oh, we're going into that debate. That's starting young, very young. I didn't realise we we're still sending kids up chimneys. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Do you think people are sick now of in the novelty's kind of war and people are just going yeah. back to back to like their own routine? I think for me, the whole change in the message from stay home to stay alert has been quite negative because I think that people have just taken it as a license that they can just pretty much do what they want. Yeah. Our household, we've we've pretty much just continued as if we we're still in lockdown. And like you say, I think the message was so mixed yeah. that people don't really understand what he said. People have thought that some of the rules are like r- a bit ridiculous. So yeah. he's basically suggesting that you can go back to work. It's a recommendation that you maintain social distancing in the workplace. But okay. with some jobs, that's just not practical. Yeah. To me, I think it's sort of the, the decision hasn't been made purely on a medical basis. The decision's been made on an economic basis as well. People it hurts are the people who don't have money to live on. Yeah. Or- because they have to go back to work. It it is it's political like to the core really. Oh, right. Well thank you very much. Thank you too. Thank you very much for taking part in the documentary guys. First of all, I just wanted to say children, you know, people who are, who had children coping or not coping in different ways. How would you summarize the time with the children? Like a massive privilege to spend more time with my children. It's not as easy to put that into practice and go through your day kind of embracing it as a privilege. Mm. Because a lot of the time it's quite difficult. I've certainly had kind of times and experiences with the kids that I couldn't be able to have. I would have enjoyed and I wouldn't have been able to have if I was at work. It's often like when they've gone to bed and you get that little bit of like space, like literal physical space because they just climb all over you all day. Like you literally just, you don't get any space mentally or physically then I do a lot of reflecting and obviously yeah like Michael was saying there like you feel I feel really guilty about things I haven't handled well and and then you have this clarity where you realize well it's massive for them you know massive like there could be all kinds of anxiety and fear and worry and changing routine and they're missing people and they don't really understand what's going on and so then yeah it's like the parent guilt like the mom guilt like probably gets you when you start feeling like I should have been more empathetic yeah in terms of quality time there's obviously not much like we kept saying oh we should you know seeing people getting all dressed up and having date nights and and then we were just like sat here on the city Michael work until really late on his laptop me just watching something not really talking to each other but no like I, I, I don't know I think we're fine <laughs> Has there been times when you've been like, not necessarily with each other, but like just like, oh my God, what the hell is going on? Oh yeah, loads, loads of, I think I think it's probably, um, for whatever reason, it's it's been really, really up and down, like noticeably up and down. I wake up dreading the fact that it's just the same repetitive day. Mm. And then I spend half my time grateful that I'm not at work because I'd always rather be at home or doing mm-hmm. things with the kids and being at work. And then half the time, kind of a little bit stuck in a rut. And I've, I've definitely found it. It's 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 noticeable as well. It's not subtle. It's really noticeable. Well, you're not. I know you're not the only person who feels like that. For me, that's definitely been the case. Like some days, I'm like really on it, and the other days, I just want to just lie around. It's quite extreme highs and lows. Definitely, I will be doing everything I can to put my full weight behind whatever collective action takes place for anyone to even suggest there's been a success blows my mind like that any single part of this has been successful or effective like actually blows my mind also I'm really worried about the mental health of people after this and I do not believe for a second that this government will provide the resources needed to deal with this unbelievable trauma probably tried my best the first however many weeks of the lockdown to to not get involved in the po- to just avoid it just for my own sanity just to avoid all the politics but definitely i think probably in the last week or so um and mainly with the cummins affair i've been drawn back into it because i think it's probably a good example of exactly the type of thing I, I've, I've consistently disliked about that side of politics mm. this isn't the end this is probably just the beginning of mm. the mental yeah, health crisis what's going to happen after all this are you sending the children back to school on june the first no no yeah, we'll just take our lead from friends who are teachers and also from the teachers union. I trust their judgment at, like a lot more than the government. So we're in a very privileged position, by the way. I recognise that, you know, for many, there is no choice and there's no judgment on, on that. Yeah. But whilst we can, we'll be doing our best to support the teachers. Thank you so, so much for taking part. I really appreciate it. It's been helpful yeah. journaling thoughts and feelings as well for the documentary. So thanks for the opportunity to be involved. No bother. Thank you, guys. Hello. Hey. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for taking part in this 
document me. I know it's been a little bit of um, hassle probably like every day having to do something, but I really appreciate it because yours has been so insightful. You found it quite especially for one of your children, quite a good thing, have you? Yeah, I really have. I think overwhelmingly, my family have responded positively in, yeah. to lockdown and actually our quality of life has massively improved. The biggest factor was my son. So my son has autism and ADHD. So from nursery, it was tricky. And then each subsequent year has become trickier and trickier. He's just happy and content, but it's really... That's shockingly surprised and how much happier he is with that being said we're starting to ease the lockdown how are you feeling about that we've really stuck to it i think how much people stuck to to the rules was a bit of a sliding scale the government have said that parents aren't going to be penalized for not sending the children back so right. mine won't go back until september yeah. i think there's a lot of things being done in other countries that our country are just not adapted at all it's quite staggering it feels like there's a desperate lack of people mentioning that we are the worst in europe in really? fact we're second worst in the world my job's never been more needed so i mean there's a huge response to the third sector um, and it's a really busy time i'm unbelievably privileged because one i'm now working full-time my income's increased i'm working from home but the circumstances of the people that i work with is just some of it is really quite quite dreadful people are hungry cold and disconnected yeah. we're talking not having phones not having a, a lot of the a lot of the reason why i'm so well is i have such a beautiful group of people around us that keep us that way and yeah. um i do 12-step fellowship meetings and i log on to those with zoom and i can do all of that because i've got a reliable phone with a charger i yeah. don't have an electricity meter that's going to cut out and I have Wi-Fi. All of those things combined, they're not guaranteed of someone who's living on universal income or benefit or whatever it's called nowadays. So, I mean, a lot of time spent with my charity is getting phones and data and food to people. It's, yeah. become, it's become that tragic. To summarise how you feel lockdown has been for you as a person and as a family, how would you summarise it? In the beginning, you were really quite positive. Then you crashed and then... Yeah come back up it does and, and there was a lot of movement in it so i made myself really miserable for the first week and i was fighting through it when lockdown first started i was terrified and i was having to live in the 24 hours so i was like just for a day i'm okay a massive shift for me was finding me level of where i felt comfortable with the kids so like was i comfortable with them playing on tiktok and watching films and how much all of that yeah. and finding that level of being able to say I'm okay. That was just dawn of a new day for me. And isn't it really like amazing how we can adapt? Yeah, well, there was a clever little thing that they did, um, which I noted, which was when Boris Johnson started lockdown three weeks too late and announced that it was going to be on for three weeks. It was interesting that he picked three weeks. It was never going to be three weeks. That was never going to be the case. But well, there's a lot of research to show that if you can adapt something for 21 days, yeah. then you can adapt to it and normalise it. And then the next time he came out, he said, funnily enough, it would be three weeks. Yeah. And so we had that additional period. Now those three weeks, two weeks, they're, they're very much, they're, they're gone. They're a bit wishy-washy. We know that there's plans, but we don't know when they're going to kick in. It's dependent on the honour. But... And because society generally is, is acclimatised to the situation, we are just kind of getting on with it now and just yes. getting on. Thank you very much, Jamie, and uh, it'd be nice to see you when all this is over. Hopefully, we've alluded to some feelings and emotions throughout this documentary that relates specifically to mental health and the impact it has on all of us. We've come to realise that our mental health is, of course, individual, which in hand means we all manage our emotions in all different ways. No one story is the same. Isolation for many will continue far beyond this lockdown period. But the most important lesson that we can take away from this is no one person should be made to feel alone. You are never alone. Remember to listen, but more importantly, remember to talk. There's always someone there to listen. Please call Samaritans on 116 123. Thank you.